I, I told myself, Chris, maybe I'd go out on my own someday. I don't know if I would have ever had the guts if I wasn't pushed out of the nest. October 1st, 08, got laid off, came home at lunch in the middle of the week. My wife's like, why are you home? And I'm like, funny story. The fifth month of being on my own full time, I made enough that month to match my former Fortune 500 salary. I was like, this is unbelievable. I'm, I don't have a boss, but not working for the man. And I made just as much as I did working for someone else. That next month, I made 20% of what I made the previous month. It wasn't until I met other MSPs that I really viewed it as this entity, this thing I've built over the last 15 years that can stand alone, that has value. Welcome to Now That's It, Stories of MSP Success, where we dive into the journeys of some of the trailblazers in our industry to find out how they used their passion for technology to help turn managed services into the thriving sector it is today. Matt Hutter, thank you very much for joining me today. You and I have uh, gotten to know each other over the past few years, and it's uh, a real pleasure chatting with you in this format. So you're the founder and the owner of Iconium Networks, a managed service provider uh, based in Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland rocks, as they say, you know. And right. uh, I don't know. I don't know if you knew this, Matt, but you know that Cleveland is the birthplace of Superman. I, I did like 1955 yeah. or I think DC comics as well. No, that's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh yeah. Obviously Krypton is the birthplace of Superman, but yeah, not, it was in the 1930s. There were these two kids from the East side of Cleveland and they like had this idea. They wrote this comic book about Superman and, and here we are today, like Cleveland, Ohio. So we got Cleveland, Ohio, LeBron James and Matt Hutter from Iconium networks. Like awesome. Super, super excited. Well, amazing you put me in that threesome yeah that's where that's that's how high i hold you awesome so so let's talk about uh your life sort of before iconium so back in the 90s um you got you got a, you have a few more years of experience than i do but back in the 90s um you were uh you had a different story you weren't you didn't own a business you were um as they say working for the man and um you had a number of different roles so Maybe tell us a little bit, Matt, about what that was like. Sure. Um, I studied electrical engineering in college. When I graduated in the early 90s, I did not go into traditional electrical engineering. I did, however, go to a VAR, as we called them back then, value-added reseller, which really, in a way, that's kind of what MSPs are today. Um, it was an AutoCAD reseller, Autodesk products. So selling to a lot of engineers, but I was a tech. I did IT support, networks. Things were very different network-wise back then in the 90s. Worked for a couple bars. Um, and then by 2000, um, went to a Fortune 500 company. Really learned a ton about business and networking there. They were in 80 countries. We managed 1,500 servers. It was wild. Um, and that was the first 15 years of my career. Really made great relationships. Still keep in touch. Two, two of my friends from the 90s at those bars own their own MSPs now. It's really neat. And we exchange business. I talked to one of them today before this call. That's great. So think back in those days. Um, were there any um, fun stories? Obviously, we don't share trade secrets. And, uh, and there's some there's some secrets that, that you can't convey. But any sort of any sort of long, long lasting memories from the times when you were a tech or leading techs or around techs, anything like that that stands out? I, I guess learning how to properly power down a server. I teach my techs that today. Rule number one, don't do it in the middle of the day. Rule number two, make sure everyone's logged out of the network or don't have any open files. Um, you only need to make that mistake once and it's burned into your memory for life. Um, we, we saw that. And then to, today, of course, dealing with cyber crises and emergencies and viruses, but um, yeah, I guess th there weren't th the internet wasn't a factor in in the mid '90s. People, both positive and negative, they didn't get into trouble doing things on the internet. But you could argue maybe we were, we were certainly not as productive um, in those days. When you were working um, for the for the mm -hmm. Fortune 500 company for these different companies, you were relatively um, satisfied in those roles, right? Like, did you ever have this? you know, dream of maybe owning an MSP at some point or owning a business at some point in time? Were you, was that always in the back of your mind or were you just kind of like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life? I'm glad you mentioned that. I did do side work. My employer mm -hmm. al allowed it. Um, I had one friend that really fed me a lot of side jobs. These small, business, small businesses he hooked me up with, 
they were okay with me servicing them on nights and weekends. Um, I actually incorporated my LLC while I still had a full-time job and um, kind of a pivotal moment in the early 2000s. I remember when I um, made enough money on the side to pay my mortgage for that month. And that was kind of an aha moment, like, wow, this thing has legs. For most people, that's your family's biggest household expense. And I was like, that, I mean, that means that I could actually support my family doing these side jobs. And so it was growing, as was my family. I have a wife and three kids uh, today, and I did then. And so, yeah, juggling family and a growing side business was a lot. I bet that was tough. Um, I've done side jobs in my early technical career as well and didn't have a family. So I can only imagine what it was like to uh, have a wife and, and kids and everything like that at the time. So so uh, 2008, I think, is the year. And uh, that was a rough year for a lot of folks, a lot of Americans in particular. Um, it was uh, known as the Great Recession, right? And for the United States, uh, some of the some of the figures I saw, domestic product was down 4.3 percent. Unemployment doubled to more than 10 percent. Home prices fell roughly 30 percent. Like it was not a good year. And you got stuck in the middle of that, didn't you, Matt? You were you were one of those casualties. Is that right? I, I was. I was still at that large Fortune 500 company uh, whom I still love today. Great people. Great company. Um, I, I told myself, Chris, maybe I'd go out on my own someday. I don't know if I would have ever had the guts if I wasn't pushed out of the net, uh, the nest, out yeah. of the nest. Uh, yeah. October 1st of 08, got laid off, came home at lunch in the middle of the week. My wife's like, why are you home? And I'm like, funny story. The next, pa- the next day, the front page of the Wall Street Journal listed that company I worked for with 600 of us. Uh, it mentioned 600 people were laid off from my employer. So it, it softened the, the blow a little bit. But um, I was happy I had the side work um, at that point. So it wasn't obviously the end of the world because you had the side work, which, again, you were able to pay your mortgage. So you had a decision to make, right? It was either um, go back and work for the man, find another job, maybe a job not in IT or a job somewhere, or go into business for yourself. So um, what were the conversations at home like? Like, what were you thinking about um, when you made that decision? My wife had seen the side work money. I'll never forget our, our first child's crib and furniture for her be- bedroom in 99. We paid for with side job money. And now my daughter's 24. So that tells you how far I've come. Um, in 08, though, um, the, the money was decent. It might have been 50% of my income on the side, which we viewed as bonus money, gravy money, use it for vacations or house furniture projects. Um, and then I think I realized um, just the concept of networking, knowing people from my church, the community, some of these side jobs I had done. And once I was able to do it during the day, normal business hours, eight to five, not nights and weekends, it, it really started to grow. Um, yeah, and it was awesome. I, I got a, a good accountant, made sure I paid myself properly tax-wise, um, and, and really uh, um, continued to grow it pretty pretty fast. Was the consulting work pretty steady when you um, were let go from the Fortune 500 company? Like, did you know that uh, – because I remember back when I did consulting, and this is always one of my fears. I think we've had this conversation offline the guts that a business owner has to have to go in and say, we're going to do this and we're going to do it like as a consulting project. And it might be really great one month and it might be really bad another month. I mean, how consistent were your customers? And was that a conversation that you and your family had to say, like, we may have good months and bad months. We're just going to have to adjust our ourselves, our spend. That, wow. It's like you read my mind. The fifth month, I remember it was about May-ish or so. The fifth month of being on my own full-time, I made enough that month to match my former Fortune 500 salary. I was like, this is unbelievable. I'm, I don't have a boss, but not working for the man. And I made just as much as I did working for someone else. That next month, I made 20% of what I made the previous month. And I was like, oh my gosh, totally feast or famine. And um, right. we'll get to the present day here eventually in this conversation, but it, it was ups and downs um, uh, with, yeah, totally sporadic. And so I think over time you started to realize, you know what, that server needs an upgrade. These people don't have antivirus. And so you, you started to think more like a business owner as you build up your network. Um, you could get a little bit of IT work from many businesses, thus creating a consistent level of income per month. That's awesome. So 
your IT tech uh, consulting, fixing computers, by the way, it was one of my favorite side jobs, but it was always the oddest times and the oddest jobs that you got called on. But yeah. then you, you say to yourself, man, like there's this opportunity to be able to create a service that is a bit more um, stable and something that I can rinse and repeat and maybe even automate. I mean, antivirus back in the day um, obviously isn't what antivirus and, and EDR and everything like that is today. But even then, if you could resell an antivirus product and say, look, we're going to keep you up to date. We're going to make sure your patch is working and things like that. We keep you up uh, patched. Like that was a lot more consistent than, hey, just call us when your computer breaks, right? Yes. And and in the early days, um, it, thinking about that consistent income, not just hourly. And you're right. It was just break fix. Um, I yeah. wasn't even thinking the term uh, MSP back then or trying to right. sell managed service. But two consistent sources of income, uh, although very small back then, were antivirus and server backups. I was like, this mm. is sweet. I can charge 100 or 200 a month on a server backup. And my margins were amazing, um, as they are today on server backups. But um, that was nice because one thing about being self-employed, especially when you're a one-man band, is um, if you don't work, you don't get paid. If you took a week off work, there is no paycheck. You are not. Yeah. Um, you don't have an employer to, to give you benefits. And so... Um, um, like a lot of small business owners, um, my wife's a teacher, she has incredible benefits and that definitely softened the blow, um, being on her benefits. And so to this day, that helps us. I think a lot of yeah. small business owners, their spouse might work for a company providing benefits. That's great. Good, good advice to those of you starting a company make sure you have a spouse or significant other that has benefits to, to, to keep you healthy. Um, sure. all right. So tell you've already shared a few of these things that, um, you were dealing with as a as a uh, as like a, a business running without employees. Think back to those days, though. What were the other sort of challenges? I mean, at what point were you thinking to yourself, "Man, I'm I'm stretched pretty thin here. I should probably think about hiring somebody or start to go that direction." What were what were some of the things that you were were dealing with as sort of a a, a one man shop back in the day? I'm just totally buried taking calls on nights and weekends. It took me five years of being self-employed to hire my first employee. He is with me to this day and you have met him, Chris. And his, yep. um, uh, he's been there 10 years, amazing employee. And um, when you look back and I only brought him in part-time 20 hours a week and wow, within a few months, I think he was full-time. Um, you look back like, man, I should have done that earlier. Like many small business decisions because it frees you up. Quick side story. Oh, now I knew they'd come to me. Here's a story that will blow your mind. His first week of work, I was um, boarding a flight to Disney with my family and a law firm we did the IT for, the paralegal got ransomware with no backup. And I'm like, good luck, Adam. I'll be in Disney. And somehow he, he got all the data back. There was no data loss. It was a complete miracle. And I still share that story with him and our employees. But um, that was neat because my family was in Disney. How am I going to fix a ransomware for a law firm from Florida? Um, and, and, but that was obviously helpful to my mental health, knowing, um, I'm not going to try to take a call from six States away on vacation to fix a customer. Awesome. So this, that hire hiring Adam was, was less of a strategic hire, more of a necessary evil, right? Like you were stretched really thin and it was time to bring some help in. Yes. And, and he, I'll give a couple shout outs to, to Adam here. He, he found GFI at the time and then SolarWinds and then Enable. And to this day, you guys are just an amazing partner. I'll tell you more about that later. Awesome. And then also he was pretty critical in convincing me of this concept of MSP. I was like, well, hourly break fixed. You might be leaving money on the table. You know, Joe Company here, ABC Company, might, we might have 100 billable hours that month. But if you're managed service, you, you're only charging this amount. But obviously, in hindsight, we know it's, it's great for many reasons, managed service for that consistent income. That's awesome. So um, I, I know Adam well, like you said, um, got to meet him in, uh, in Austin a few months back. And um, he is every bit of talented as, as you say he is. Um, did, you, uh, did you just get lucky with Adam? Or was this like when you were doing, when you were going out looking for that type of resource there, the, to, to come in and help you again, part-time at the beginning, was there a certain characteristic a certain talent or something like that, that, that you were really looking for? 
probably just a break fix PC tech and he's got an yeah. advanced degree. He was, um, I mean, yeah, he, he was, I would say overqualified for the job, but it, it was, it was actually just Craigslist. I don't even think indeed was around. Um, yeah. I don't know if Zip Recruiter was in 2013. If they were, they didn't have the impact they do today for hiring small business employees. Um, and, and so, um, total random happenstance. He and I joke about the tiny office we were in. It was like a janitor broom closet where I interviewed him. Like we were almost knees to knees, like close to each other. And then I, I hired him. And as I said, went out of town pretty early on that first week. But, um, yeah, I think it was, it was luck that I got someone so yeah. amazing thinks like a business owner truly well, thinks like an owner. it may have been luck that you you got an individual like that early on as your first hire and that he's still with you but uh, actually i don't think that's luck that he's still with you i think you've you've obviously done things over the the past you know 13 years or however long he's been with you um to not only in in in, in, in like enhance him and and um and encourage him to stay with you i mean he's your coo now but what have you done? You've sort of mentored him. You've, you've shown him the ropes. You've shown him sort of what it takes to, to run a technology unit and, and think forward. And, you know, what are the types of things that you did to obviously keep Adam around and, and other employees that you have? Yeah, as the company grew, I um, really wanted to keep his benefits and pay package um, on par for the Cleveland area. And then we, with regards to the business, um, uh, kind of creating a template. It might have been in our head and then on paper eventually for new techs, um, how to troubleshoot problems. If there's a stressful situation at, at a customer, go through these steps, one, two, three, to get them back up. Um, and then onboarding customers, um, how to determine what's a good fit for a customer. That's only in recent years where we, we might be turning business away if they don't meet our uh, company goals or objectives. But um, um, oh, picking vendors. That's huge. We, let's say we have 20 to 30 products we sell now. We're pretty picky. Mostly it's me. And you guys know um, if you or Chris, if you're very technical, um, um, techs like geek products and they get excited about various products like, oh, let's start selling this. This is so cool. But as the owner, you know, that's a level of complexity you're adding, uh, having to pay another vendor, learning their products, getting all the techs up to speed on those products. Um, it can be kind of time consuming uh, resource resources are needed in it. And so, but I'm, I'm really blessed that one of my very first partners was enable um, and just how they view MSPs. Um, I'm, I'm amazed and impressed at how um, you, you guys talk to us like you're in the streets with us out there selling to customers, even though you're a, a company, you know, a thousand times bigger than me, you, you talk to us like we're on the same level. It's very cool. I think it's cool to have people in Enable that have actually been in your shoes or at least worked for companies your size. And I and there's there's a number of us here. I'm I'm one that was at a 20 person MSP that eventually became a 300 person MSP. I don't know if that's your your goal someday, Matt, but um to be able to share my experiences, it's very rewarding. I love doing that with you and and others. I mean, it's a it's a great job. So uh thanks for the the shout out for sure, but um, but, you, but you put you, in a yeah. Um, yeah, you you have extra street yeah. cred because you have worked at you're 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 at a big company now, but you're at a smaller um, Ohio based MSP, and you literally walk the talk, Chris. It's great because you you were on that growth track with that company, and you know all the struggles. The technology's changed today in in this current year, but the people issues haven't. They'll probably be around forever and how to run a business, and so yeah. those things repeat themselves um, regardless of the size of the company you work for. For sure. Thanks. Uh, so you obviously didn't stop with Adam. Iconium's continued to grow both with the number of customers that you supported, um, but also the number of talented engineers. And so I'm just curious, how have you balanced your sort of strategic hiring over the past um, 10 decade or so since you've hired um, Adam? And what are the ways that you're, you know, obviously it's a little different. You don't use Craigslist anymore. So what are some of the ways that you're going out there and finding talented techs um, so that they're the right people on the bus, right? The right, the right people on the bus yes. in the right seats on the bus. How are you doing that today? Yes. That's um, a term I now use as well. Um, yeah. It's, it's been informal networking on my own. I, I get resumes a couple times a year. Most of the times I ignore them, but if they're a family friend or someone I know it has, it has extra weight. Um, one guy, this is wild his dad and I worked for that initial VAR or reseller in the nineties. Uh, we were in it for that company. 
Um, and I, I hired his son like a year ago. It's pretty wild. And, and uh, um, that was obviously a word of mouth deal. Uh, another tech, um, I'm friends with, uh, he was a friend of the family and, and this guy, his name's Matt, he sent me a resume and he's like, you should really give this guy a look. He's amazing. And, and he is amazing. I've hired him and um, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we, we want a certain baseline technical knowledge, of course, but the people skills are huge. We get compliments on our customer service. We still answer the phone directly. We have a voicemail system, but you still get a live person answering the phone. Um, but I, I kind of feel like I, I want kind of soft people skills equal or more than tech skills because you can train up a tech to learn the products, but you, you can't really change someone's personality. You can't make an introvert an extrovert. And so um, you, usually early on in an interview, you, you kind of know what kind of people person they are. That's great. How do you know <clears throat> when to hire that next tech? I know that's obviously a, a challenge that um, many MSPs face and, and you may be in that same boat, but how do you balance that? Like, you know, you add a few more customers, do you go back and talk to Adam and the rest of the team and go, can we support this? Or, or how do you, how do you know when, when's the right time to, to pull the trigger and, and hire somebody else? I'd say looking at our capacity, if one or two techs are out either sick or on vacation, how slammed do we get, um, one answer I think probably a lot of MSPs give is um, if you just took on a new customer, there's one, <clears throat> excuse me, there's one down the street from us. We're bidding an MSP proposal on. For us, this is huge. They're actually an auto dealer, um, uh, 80, it'd be 80 devices, which is probably near the top of what we can currently handle today. That might be a decision that we'd have to bring on someone else. Um, we've sort of earmarked some techs are kind of like named accounts and they might support customer XYZ or ABC. We do a little co-managed service. We have some techs that are on site X, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> X amount of hours per month um, or week, um, mostly just placating the customer, making them feel happy. We have a handful of those, but I guess right now it's my gut feel. I do have a solid PSA that I could, I'm sure look at our utilization rates, which I'll do more. We're getting close to having a year of data with that current PSA we use. And so um, um, I could probably find the hard numbers answer to that question. When are we busting at the seams from a, a utilization rate? But right now, it's mostly my gut feel. What's the mood sure. of the office? People stress because we're taking on too much. Might be time to help. Yep. Yeah, that's good. And and that sort of brings up another point. I mean, we, we've talked about the, the staff and, and the people because, of course, they're one of the most important pieces of the business, right? You have to have a talented techs. You have to have people that love coming to work and, and see this as a family, especially a, an MSP your size, right? It's a family. You're spending the majority of the time in a room, in a building, in an office, on a call with, with the same folks every single day. So when it comes to the people, the, the, the businesses that you're servicing, is there a certain type of business that is really attractive to you? Um, or even more importantly, is there a certain type of, um, or a type of customer, maybe even not a, maybe even not a vertical, but a type of customer that your techs go, you know what, this is going to be a great customer. They see the value. We're going to do really well. Like this is going to really work out. What, how do you, how do you sort of measure and balance, you know, your customers? And, and do you ever say, you know what, that's not a good fit. That business is not a good fit for us. Yeah, I can answer uh, two pieces of that question. Specific yeah. industries, we're implementing traction and EOS here recently, and we just had that roundtable discussion a couple of days ago. We, we tend to like or do well with accounting firms, law firms, and, and nonprofits, specifically churches. Uh, it started with my own church, and now we've got a, quite a bit of them, and, and they seem to have a fair amount of uh, steady revenue and income, and the, the leaders at these nonprofits or churches are fans of technology and, and they're all managed service um, to this day. Um, so those are some industries we like and they seem to be reasonable users except accountants around April 15th. Um, and then um, uh, as far as maybe profitable segments or specific business owners we go after, I guess ones that really look at kind of at a 20,000 foot level uh, of their business. Some are growing at a break, breakneck speed and they they recognize the value of technology and they don't nickel and dime us. I'm like, hey, if you want us to clean up your server room, that's going to be maybe a couple grand in a project fee. And they're like, fine, do it. When can you do it? And so you, you love customers that, that don't uh, beat you up on every the minutia of, of each price. 
Um, yeah. And we do have a handful of those. You, you almost actually those are dream accounts. Those are golden accounts where you, you kind of know any proposal you give them, they're going to appro approve. And so we have a couple of those. They're 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 great. And, um, yeah, we love those. Those are great. I remember when you can build that trust, and it sounds like between you and Adam and and some of the rest of your team, like you're doing that with a lot of your your customers and and a lot of those businesses. If they know that Matt or Adam or one of us comes one of those guys come to us and say, you know what, you really need to replace this application or this server. Um, there's a good chance they're going to say, okay, we better do that because we believe them. They're our IT department. But there are those other types of businesses that think IT is just an expensive thing that they have to pay and they don't really value it. And so I agree with you 100%, Matt. Like There are partners that value IT and and they value your opinion and and you don't just like, you have to earn that the you keeping them up and running for the last number of years and answering their questions in a uh, reasonable fashion, politely, you talk about customer service. That's really, really powerful. But as soon as you check those couple of boxes there, a lot of times those businesses can become fans of yours and happily answer whatever you ask of them. Yes, please buy. Yeah. We would love to buy that from you or, service that yeah you're you're right the the trust is huge chris we mm -hmm. i'm in a networking group i told you called bni it's it's been a large reason for the the growth of my business and one of their slogans is people do business with people they know like and trust and we are now to the point where um it we have a couple uh, partners local uh, specialist in other industries that I will bring in, um, specifically a VoIP phone guy, my friend who um, owns a, a local VoIP company, and then network infrastructure, and then even document specialist, a guy, a friend of mine owns a copier company. It it might sound cavalier to say this, but some of our customers, I, the deal's already closed before I've even brought in my partners or friends. They're like, if you recommend this phone guy, just tell us how much and we'll do it. You like this copier guy, just bring them on in. And so you, you don't develop those kind of relationships overnight. You, you want them to know, like, and trust you. But once that trust level is high, um, it's great because you can provide more solutions to them with other trusted partners rather than, uh, rather than them randomly Googling, you know, copier companies or, or VoIP phone providers in Cleveland. And so um, it, you kind of get this momentum or it's like an avalanche. Once you do so many deals, you can be like, Hey, you know, meet my friend, Daryl. Um, we've done 40 phone deals together and they're like, sign me up. Um, if you need any reference accounts, we've got 40 of them. Same with the copier That's guy. Great. And it, it's neat because I might not benefit directly financially from those deals, but it, it makes my customer happy because they're, they're now partnering with another trusted local company who's got a proven track record um, for many reasons. Um, you know, the quality of the product, their price, customer service, et cetera. And so it's, yeah. it's wild. And in some ways we can be jack of all trades to our customers. I love it. I think of like, what was it? The miracle on 34th street. It's kind of like the Macy's gimbals thing, right? Like they come to you and go, do you, do you sell this? And you say, no, but this place down the street does. And I really recommend them. And so yeah. when you're that trusted advisor and you can recommend a, another firm, number one, you don't have to deliver that service out of your MSP. And now you've got a fan that can send business back to your direction. So that's, yes. that's really it, beautiful. That's it's awesome. an amazing networking opportunity. Yeah. As you've grown Iconium, um, when did you really begin to think about the future state of the business? Was it early on, Matt? Like, had you just hired Adam and you said, well, I got to think about this. Like, we're going to grow this up. Or was it later on when you said, you know what? I know. I think we can do better. We can play better in this market. Like, there's a service that we aren't delivering. Like, when? what was that point when you just said, we got to think differently about the business. A couple factors. Uh, one of the bosses I had in the early '90s hooked me up with one of the most famous small business books of all time. It's called *The E Myth Revisited*, I believe, by Michael Gerber, and that breaks down your hats you wear into three major categories: owner, manager, and technician, I believe. And two, well, first of all, when you're self-employed, you know, you could be a dentist, you could be an IT person or a landscaper, you're doing the actual labor. You are the tech, mm -hmm. whether it's a cutting lawns, fixing computers or fixing teeth. Um, and then when you hire people, you have to be a manager, you're managing people and you might still be a tech, but we, we need to think of ourselves as owners. And that's a perfect dovetail into me partnering with Enable. Um, it wasn't until I met 
other MSPs at events you guys have hosted and become friends with these guys that I really viewed it as this entity, this thing I've built over the last 15 years that can stand alone, that has value. Early on, most business owners just think that you're a tech that putting bread on the table and you've created one job with one paycheck. But talking to these other MSPs, it, it's really neat because some are older or younger than me. Some have higher or lower sales than me. Um, it, it, I never even thought about you know private equity, exit strategies, the value of the company. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's been wild to think I've kind of built this thing over the years and it, it's the standalone entity um, that uh, is beyond just Matt Hutter. That's awesome. So uh, we'll talk more about those here in a minute, but there's something else that I think is super, super exciting. So Matt, you are, in my opinion, a very passionate speaker. Every time we talk, you know, my eyes light up because um, you're, you've just done something, you've read something, you're excited about something. And I love hearing your stories, but something you told us recently um, about the way that you look at your finances versus sort of several years ago, I, it was really, really impactful. Um, so much so that we, we're going to have you come speak at, at our next program, but yeah. I'd love for you to maybe share a little bit about what you do today compared to what you did just a few years ago when it comes to looking at your finances. Sure. Um, it, it, it was a book I read by a, believe it or not, the author of this book was a former MSP owner. His name's Michael Michalowicz. Um, I think he's located in New Jersey. And the book he's written, maybe seven or eight and or more, um, his, his breakaway bestseller is called Profit First. And it's really, really neat, Chris. Um, you are divvying up the income as it comes into the business into several buckets. I had told you previously when my wife and I were married, we used the, um, when we first got married almost 30 years ago, we used the envelope system. You want to save up for a couch, take part of your paycheck, put 20 bucks a week into this envelope. Before you know it, you have a thousand bucks for a new couch. In a way, that is what profit first is. You are, um, let me take a side note here. If you've ever had a large tax bill you couldn't afford, many times it's because the business did so well and I didn't save enough money, but um, those problems go away. It is, it is absolutely extraordinary. You're, you're forcing yourself to funnel money into various accounts uh, twice a month you do this. And the end result is never before have I had so many piles of cash just laying around the business. It's so cool. Um, you, the, I, I don't necessarily need to do a deep dive into the different categories, but some of right. them are you have a tax account. You have one for the owner, uh, operating expense, just keeping the lights on, running the business. You break them down into certain percentages and it, it forces you to be disciplined to have these buckets of money um, for expenses that'll come up in the future. And um, one other thing I, I still do to this day, which some people might think is crazy, um, I, I still manually reconcile the bank accounts myself. And um, I, I actually read an article in the Wall Street Journal, a guy that owns like a $50 million company and he has thousands of employees. And he still does it because he likes having a pulse on the finances. And of course, his accounting department, his bookkeeping department can do that, but it forces me to see the day-to-day -day expenses. And um, wow. believe it or not, I have seven bank accounts, which is a lot, but it's part of that is because of profit first, but it, it's wild. And today, today's actually the first day of the month, the, the day that the new bank uh, statements come out. Wow. Well, the other thing that I thought was really neat about that is number one, that, that, um, you're a big reader. You've read several books. You've talked about several things you've read that have sort of made you think differently about the business. But this one was interesting because you bought this and it sort of sat on your shelf for a little oh, bit, thank right? You for reminding me. Yeah. I, I had it for like a year or six months. I'm like, wow, this sounds amazing. I'll get around to it later. I got invited to a local networking event. It was actually a women's business owner event. And he spoke at the event. I knew some of the ladies there. They invited me. And um, when I shook his hand and talked to the owner, he's like, hey, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I own an MSP. And he's like, that was my first business. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, could I have a bigger sign in front of me that says I need to do this? And, <laughs> and I did it like that week. And it's it wow. is it's it's amazing. You, you just um, you you I, I, it, it might be a stretch to say it makes all your money problems go away. But boy, does it get close. It is. And it's wild, guys, because I could see large businesses even doing this, that this, you know, you, you, some of them get into the trap of uh, equity lines or credit card debt or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. That's great. Well, and the other, the last thing on Profit First that I thought was neat is 
most companies look at the revenue like, ah, this is what I want this quarter's revenue to look like and next quarters and next year's and everything like that. And you're looking at your profit. You have profit goals, right? And and that's what you're thinking about now. It, it is so cool. In the book, he forces you to take a tiny, tiny baby step and just carve out 1%. That sounds like a joke. That's a rounding error. What is 1%? But it, it's amazing. I don't know. I don't care how much you make. It, over time, that 1% adds up. And it. he's like, I don't care how poorly your business is run. You can find a way to squeeze out 1%. And that is one of the buckets or uh, accounts you use. And then um, mine has grown beyond that 1% now. And it's neat because it feels like free money. He actually encourages you every quarter to take half that money out and just go do something fun, go on a vacation with your spouse or do a home project, put a deck on. Because the book starts out in the first chapter, it says, too many of us are grinding it out day by day, owning a small business. And at the end of the year, you have no profit. And you're like, how could this be? Like, this is, why am I doing this? I should go back right. to work and the man. And um, um, over time, that 1% could be 3%, could be 5%. And it, 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 it really does um, feel like found money because you're, you're basically telling the rest of the business, keep your hands off this account, this is my profit. Um, and before profit first, some of, us, some of us might say we are that disciplined to do that, but I think a lot of us are not. And, and the money just gets blent in together, it's one huge account, and the expenses just fly out. Wow, that's great. Matt, thank you so much for sharing that. I, it, I love you telling that story because I, again, I can see the passion, I can see how excited you know the last year or so has been for you. And, uh, and I remember you telling, talking to Robert, my uh, colleague, about that in uh, in Las Vegas at our Empower event. And um, and you haven't stopped talking since then. That was last year. So I'm really excited that that's working well for you. It, no, it's great. And this is a side story, but it does tie in. I had my first and only M&A event. I acquired another MSP around that same time, um, 2018, when I implemented Profit First. And I, I did take on some debt, and it was very stressful. But as a result of Profit First, those two kind of worked out together. I paid off that business very fast, uh, less than a year, and just became extremely profitable. And then the pandemic was actually equally uh, profitable for us. We, we grew um, cyber, uh, VPN, Teams, a lot of that remote work. Maybe I was a bad salesman or I wasn't pushing it that well. But each sub subsequent year during the pandemic, we kept in increasing revenue and profit year after year. And so, but looking back, profit first really helped me pay off that MSP I acquired pretty quickly, whether that was intentional or not. Fantastic. Congratulations on that. That's uh, quite an accomplishment there for sure. Thank you. So uh, I mentioned in the beginning in the introduction that you, you and I have known each other for at least a couple of years now. I think uh, first time we met, I visited your, your old office, came up yeah. to visit you, telling you a little bit about what eventually became our business transformation programs. And then a few years back, I think last year, you attended the one of the first, the inaugural, it was yeah. my first program. I did one on co-manage. And then this past April, I don't know if it's just me, that's why you come, but I hosted a program on, uh, on security, the business of security. So can you talk a little bit about how programs like business transformation, things that vendors do for MSPs like yourself, how they've helped Iconium into looking sort of more forward into their growth, their continued growth? Wow, you have an amazing memory. I can't believe you remember every event I've been yeah. to in the last 18 months. You're 100% accurate. Um, I, I would say at this point, I'd run through a brick wall for Enable. The um, events, if you if you are a vendor for a, a business, you, you provide a quality product and you may give training on it. Could be a dentist, could be an MSP, could be a landscaper. But what Enable does is uh, give us tips and, and tricks and huge things for, for running the business. Here are some specific examples. Um, uh, Stephanie, with all of her marketing expertise, like a, a lot of us don't tend to take that seriously. You guys have webinars that I can do or virtual events from my own computer here in Cleveland and in-person events, both at Empower and some of these MSP gatherings at your offices we've done. Things that really have nothing to do with day-to-day -day use of the technical products you guys sell to us but um, ideas um, um, on how to grow our business, maybe how to expand a certain vertical market, how to fire um, bad customers that are not a good fit for you. Um, like I said, the, the market builder product and all that offerings. Here's an amazing, another seminar you guys have had, just um, teaching us to get our customers in the habit of annual price increases. I might complain that my grocery bills are going up each month, but how dare I raise it for my customers? 
um, some of these seminars, specifically about Stephanie or other staff at, at Enable, they've helped us get our customers in the mindset that um, this is just a reality of life and, and you should prepare for it um, once a year. But I, I would call those non-technical um, events you guys host that really help us grow our MSPs that have nothing to do with technical products, really business owner thing. Awesome. I appreciate that. Uh, we, we enjoy having partners like yourself, Matt, and um, it's always great to get your feedback from these afterwards. You know, one of the things that Robert and I do on the business transformation programs is we ask everybody to rate every single aspect, whether it was the breakfast, the lunch, the dinner. We want to know everything so that we constantly improve it. But to hear the uh, the comments, just like you mentioned about, well, you know, I it, I walked away with three or four things that I never would have thought I should try, and and I'm going to try them because I've heard others were were successful with it. So I love hearing that stuff. So uh, we're going to continue to do a Matt, and and I look forward to having you at, at additional ones too. Thank you. It's it's great. I other smaller. I be, I'm. 51 years old, I've kind of started to mentor smaller one man or one woman band MSPs in the Cleveland area. And I, I, I recommend you guys for many reasons. And it's neat because you, you all do walk the talk. And I like that a lot of you came from smaller organizations. Like, I guess you might have people who spent their entire career at Enable, but I doubt it. Some of them um, or most of you probably worked elsewhere. So you have outsider experience, which is, is useful, I think. That's definitely true. Most of us have worked somewhere else. Um, and there's a handful that have been with us for, for a long, long time or have been with us and then left and then came back because uh, Enable is a, uh, is a great company, a great company to work for. And uh, we love service in our, our partners as well. So thank you for that, for sure. No, you're great. Awesome. All right. So um, I've got one more question for you. So I told you I was going to ask this. So this is the, um, the Now That's It podcast. And the reason we call it Now That's It is... We love partners telling their stories like you have over the last hour or so. And I'd love to really hear if you think back, and I know you've had a couple of them. I heard a couple of them in there. But if you think about, back about that biggest, you know, inflection point or that dis, that thing that happened, like when did you know that that's it, Matt, like that that you did the right thing by, you know, not uh, not going and back and working for the man again and starting your own business? When did you know that was it? I I would say only in the last few years i was happy chugging along as a one-man band then hiring adam but i I think over time knowing that when i leave the office for a week or more and the building doesn't burn down it's i've hired a great team i can trust um this entity can stand on its loan i'm still the leader the owner i give it direction and insight for the future but um it, it was pretty close to when i partnered with enable learning that um these MSPs are, are real standalone entities. They're a growing sector of the economy. Every business on the planet needs an MSP, whether they know it or not. And so when I still, um, I, I realize most people do work for other companies, but it, it's really kind of a neat uh, kinship or brotherhood or community um, meeting other MSPs because we can kind of share stories together. And so I'd say um, probably in the last five years, maybe 2017, 2018, um, I, I realized um, kind of what I've built here and it, it's really neat. Um, yeah, I'd say that's when it happened. That's great. You have built an amazing business. Um, I am one of the few that was lucky enough to actually be, in, be inside your doors and you tell me that the new office is even better. So I'm going to have to to come visit you next time I'm in uh, the land. Uh, yeah. And, uh, I, you know, Matt, let me just tell you, it, I want to thank you so much for, for chatting with me today. Um, it is great hearing your stories. I love talking to you. And uh, I want to wish you and the Iconium Network team the absolute best of luck in the future. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.